All right, so here's the thing. My January wrap up has been a slog to edit, partly because February was a really full month in many ways, both great and not so great. I just didn't have a lot of time to edit. I am still going to post that, but I finally realized if I waited for that to be done, I would never upload anything ever again. So I finally decided to cut my losses and tell you about the books that I read in February. And also I am going to try and make this a less edited video. So it's going to be chattier. I'm still going to edit some blunders, but you know, um, let's just do it more informally because I have less and less time to edit these days. <laughs> So before we begin, let's talk numbers. I have made the decision to stop counting proofs that I don't request, but that we get in the shop and sometimes I just take to just check them out because I realized I wasn't giving a lot of books that I should be giving chances to just because I was like, oh, I have too many books already, but I do want to be able to take the proofs and give them a read, give them a shot. I've DNF'd already some, but that will come in the March wrap up. I want to have that freedom. The point of keeping track of my books is not only to not spend as much money on books, but also to keep my book number down because again, when I have to move, it's going to be a challenge. But yeah, I just made that choice because it makes sense to me. My book count has come down a little bit, not enough. And it's because in February, I engaged in some retail therapy because again, it was a very harsh month. And so I think I purchased around 15 books. Let me, let me count. Not that bad. Eight books, still not great. Like I, I think I want to get to the point where I'm buying books to be reading right away for now. Save for a few exceptions, but yeah. We'll see how that goes. Uh, so far in March, I've bought four books, which is not bad. And also I've read one of them already. And the other one is I'm starting after the book I'm finishing now. So because one of those is for the Booker International. Have you seen the long list? If you haven't, I'm going to link it down below. It's good. This year's list was so surprising. The only two that I was familiar with and expecting to be there were Whale and Boulder. Boulder especially. For some reason, I thought it wasn't eligible, but when I learned it was, I was very certain it was going to be there. Other than that, so many books I hadn't even heard about and a lot that I had heard about but I wasn't necessarily planning on reading but now I'm doing it I'm reading the entire long list I'm not doing it as a video project because just too much stuff going on but I will be reading the long list um, hopefully in time for the short list and so I will probably make a short list video with like my favorites and my predictions. Ooh, that'll be fun. So we'll see if I can get through it all before May. Mm, it's it's looking dodgy, but if, if possible, I would like to. Yeah, that's my quick life update. By the way, my job is totally getting to me in a good way. It's just that I wanna be reading things in service of my job and that has not completely transformed the way I read and I hope it doesn't. But also it does make me consider like, oh, well, I've heard about this book so much. I don't need to read it. I'd rather read something that like I can't talk about unless I read, which is awful. So I've, I've been trying to keep a balance between, okay, these are books that I've been meaning to read for a long time and I want to get to them. And also I should read this because it's coming up and I want to be able to talk about it and recommend it, etc. Okay, so first let me tell you about two pretty disappointing DNFs. One was an absolutely devastating disappointment and that is An Exciting and Vivid Inner Life by Paul Dalla Rosa, which is a collection of short stories and it's supposed to be, and it is, they are a lot about sexuality and being gay in the 21st century, hustle culture, economics, that sort of thing. The topics are really interesting. It's just that the style is 
vapid i think on purpose i think it's trying to mirror sort of interculture internet experience i i just couldn't to me it's normal people and this not because the styles are similar it's just i think they are styles that are maybe purposefully so bland in order to act as reflective surfaces i definitely think that and there might be value in it i I'm not sure, but you can argue that there is value in literature and media in general and art in general that does that, but I can't stand it. I want good, exquisite, exciting, interesting writing. And this was everything but. And I tried jumping around short stories here, but no, no, it's just... But if you like this sort of bland, choppy sentence, contemporary writing style, then yeah, give this a shot. I know a lot of people will like it. I just couldn't get into it. This one was much more successful, um, Daryl by Jackie S. This is about a person who at the beginning identifies as a man and then that sort of changes. They never get to identify as a woman either it's kind of like that exploration but the conceit is that they are a man who enjoys the lifestyle which is basically cuckolding and the reason they enjoy this is because they like to feel like a beta male and a sissy and that sort of thing and so through these really weird surreal honestly kind of 90s or like early noughties wacky interactions they arrived at like a clearer sense of themselves and i was so into this i actually read the first few pages and i was like i had to get this because listen to these first lines you live vicariously through celebrities i live vicariously through the guys who fuck my wife but sure okay i'm the weird one let me ask you this do you watch sports at all I could ask, what's the point if you aren't one, the one playing? But it isn't exactly a fair question. So I was so intrigued when I first picked this up. But the thing is, it goes on forever. It's so short and yet I could have slashed half of it. Mm, not half, I would say a third in the middle. So I skipped a few pages and then I went to the end and read uh, some of the chapters. So I still read, if this is how long? Um, 177 or 8 pages long, I still read about 100 pages of it. So it's not like a horrible DMF, I thought the style was pretty well achieved. I love the exploration of gender, the author is trans herself, so she knows what she's talking about, and it's, again, super interesting. I just a little less forgiving. This could have been edited down, but it's still a solid, solid book. And so if you are looking for a romp that's satirical and explores gender from a very particular perspective, give Daryl a try because it's, it's quite interesting. Okay, really quickly, let's do Children's Corner because as you know, I'm a bookseller now and I have to read, well, I don't have to, but I choose to read children's books when I have the chance so I can be informed and recommend good books. And so I read The Hagasaurus by Rachel Bright. This is a board book and it's actually really, really cute. I really recommend it to give to your youngest readers in your life. The daughter dinosaur goes to play with friends and something bad happens and she thinks, oh no, how can I fix this? And she fixes it with a hug and she thinks back to her dad explaining how hugs make things better, um, but you also have to ask. So it's, it's just so cute, a focus on friendship, but also like father-daughter relations, which is always cute. So yeah, I recommend that. And I also recommend The Pirate Moms by Jody Lancent Grant and this is beautifully illustrated. It's about these two moms who are pirates enthusiasts and so they're always dressing up as pirates which their son finds embarrassing and so he's mortified when he finds out they are going to chaperone the school outing but then suddenly they are trapped and they need their pirate know-how. It is great because it is not using a metaphor to embody queerness, so it's not like the purple skin people uh, are valid as the normal skin people, which is a very dehumanizing metaphor to teach about racism. The queerness is on the page, but also it's not the main issue. The issue that makes 
the mom's other is something completely unrelated and then it's valuable. So the lesson is taught through metaphor, but also the queerness is on the page, which I think is really important. And the illustrations are gorgeous, the writing's great, really recommend. And then I read Oh No George and Shh, We Have a Plan by Chris Houghton. And Chris Houghton is a classic children's author by this point. Delicious, like so fun. Oh No George is about this dog that at first is very naughty and then he learns the lesson, or does he, that sort of thing. It's a bit mischievous, but in a very playful way. And I don't know, I just really recommend it. It's the kind of book that you want to read to your child and or, you know, nephews, nieces you get what I mean. Then a book that I listened to on audio, We Are All Completely Besides Ourselves by Karen Joy Fowler. This is about a young girl who is reminiscing about growing up and about having lost a member of her family. I don't remember if in the back cover of the book, because I have seen the physical copy of this book, I don't remember if they explain what's going on, which I would consider a bit of a spoiler, because you do realize early on, but also when it comes, it is supposed to be a revelation, so I won't spoil it, but it's pretty interesting because it looks at science, at humanity, at relations, like family relationships, also like what constitutes humanity and intelligence. If it were like a film category, it would be sort of comedy drama kind of thing, because it's quite funny and flippant at times, but it also tugs at your heartstrings without being melodramatic. So I really recommend it. I found the narration extraordinary. It is, again, first person, so it really worked for me. And the narrator really embodied that first person, and it was a really good narration. I haven't listened to another audiobook since, I don't think. I also read All Down Darkness White by Sean Hewitt, which is a memoir that I actually mentioned in my February possibility pile for LGBT plus history month. I will link that video down below. Um, that TBR was semi-successful. Um, I read some of the things from there. Some of them I've started and haven't finished. It was, it was good. I liked having that pile there. This is a memoir about Sean Hewitt's own coming to terms with his homosexuality, but also one early relationship he had in uni, I think, and then a long-term relationship he had where the former one died by suicide and the second one lived with really, really intense oppression and Sean Hewitt had to be there for him and then they realized their relationship was untenable and had to break up. I really, really like this. It is super well written. It is beautiful and heartbreaking and very honest. However, for reasons that are completely valid, Sean Hewitt admits at the end that he amalgamates some characters, that he changes names. A lot of the things are sort of recreations. And I find the question of autofiction versus memoir quite fascinating. I don't think the book is any less good because of it, but I do think it is just an interesting consideration to have. Overall, I don't think this has stayed with me as much as I expected. I liked it. Again, it's really, really good. The Manly Hopkins poems analysis, which are like a big part of, of the book because it's a big part of uh, Sharon Hewitt's research, are really great and they really add to the emotional and erotic depth of the novel because it is a lot about desire and what desire does and like the rich expansive possibilities of desire and I really really appreciated that so this is really good this was really solid like 3.5 stars sort of thing it's just that it lost steam at some point I don't know I don't know what it is that I loved it but I didn't adore it it's strange. Still super recommended. I will hand sell it whenever I get the chance and it's a really really good book. The choice of having bisexual colors on the cover though. Interesting choice. Really interesting choice. Anyways, really good memoir. One of those memoirs that goes beyond just personal experience which is something I always appreciate. Superbly well written because Sean Hewitt is a poet. Yeah, 
it really, really works. Okay, next two books I am not going to really review because they are for the Book Deprived Prize and I cannot review them at all. Uh, but I did finish Read Dangerously by Asar Nafizi and also a poet, Frank O'Hara, My Father and Me by Ada Calhoun. And uh, yeah, I will speak about those in my Booktube Prize wrap up, which will come in April. I am not gonna lie, I'm a bit behind, but not extremely. So I, I just need to catch up. It's just this time around, I only did ebooks, and you know, I, I have a hard time reading ebooks, especially because a lot of my ebook reading time is at the gym, and I was ill for like a week and a half where I didn't go. So, yeah. Anyways, um, I will get back to you on those ones. Now, let's talk about physical books. I have five books to tell you about. I'll tell you about a book that was just okay, that I liked. It was, it was fine. Um, Eileen Gray, A House Under the Sun by Charlotte Malter Bartz and Sozia Gierzowska. I'm sorry. I'm profoundly sorry. This is about um, architect and designer Eileen Gray, who was a really important modernist and queer woman. It's all right. It tells you a little bit about her and embodies her character and it's told through different vignettes and different like narrative strands. There are a few chronological time jumps and I don't know, I just read it and I was like, oh, okay, that's good. I really like the art style, I will say. I like the palette and how it really reflected emotional depth, but I think the plotting of it is quite diffuse. It's very confusing. I think sometimes you don't understand why the characters or the people arrived to where they, they did. Yeah, I don't know. I will keep it because I would like to revisit it. I also think I maybe didn't read it at the best of times. I'm sorry, I, I don't have that much to say about it. And yet another book I won't say that much about because it is for a different video project that will come at some point, And that is The Mismeasure of Man by Stephen J. Gould or gold. The subtitle for this is A Brilliant and Controversial Study of Intelligence Testing. And as the tin says, this is all about intelligence and debunking racist assumptions that have been made about intelligence. So it goes quite in depth into the methods through which people measured intelligence and how they arrive to those methods and how they are flawed and why they are racist and how yeah most of these tests are designed to be racist because you can be trained in them and like a lot of people won't have been trained in them just by design or just by like cultural expectations so it's really interesting and i really enjoyed it the press is good it's actually really good this is also an older edition so i did get an e version as well subsequent edition afterwards and like essays responding to for example the bell curve and stuff like that and so i like this i didn't love it i think it's quite exhausting especially because it's a debunking book it is really really thorough in its analysis of the tests which can get super boring because you already know they are flawed so it's like, okay, I understand that they are flawed. Do I really want to read like 10 pages on exactly why after I learned the like main gist of the mechanism? I'm not sure, but I would still recommend it if it's something that interests you, probably get the newer edition, but this one was really cheap. So I'm glad I got that one. And then three books that I absolutely adored. Sensible Footwear, a Girl's Guide by Kate Charlesworth. This I found often exhausting because it's like a lot of visual information and a lot of collage techniques and I had to be in the mood for it. Well, in February, I was so in the mood for it. It is so good, so fun. The way she talks about gender, she talks about activism, she traces the UK specifically history of like queerness in popular culture and underground culture and also interweaves memoir and personal experience and it's so good 
I will say the memoir aspects often feel very random or like you have to catch up a lot because this is not really a memoir. It's more like a historical document or kind of archive sort of thing. So when she does pop up, you're kind of like, wait, wait, how old are you now? Where are you? And there are some scenes where it's like, okay, this does not seem very relevant. You could have like cut to the chase. And then there are other things where you are wondering why she didn't explain this or how she got there and you wish there would have been a little more clarity about that or a little bit like she had expanded more upon certain areas of her life and then there are other scenes where I thought they could have just been cut so there is a bit of sort of awkward pacing however it's still really solid and the art style is gorgeous there is so much humor but also compassion and anger like rightful anger and a sense of how things were really bad at some points but also even at the worst of times there was hope and there was people fighting um for us all really so yeah really recommend it if you're into graphic nonfiction, especially queer stuff you just kind of miss this another book i adored Fire Island, Love, Loss and Liberation in an American Paradise by Jack Parlett. It's just so good. This is a cultural history of Fire Island, which in case you don't know, is a strip of land off the coast of Long Island, um, so New York. And it is an iconic queer party scene and resort scene, sort of. But it also has a lot of posh conservative family. So it, it was always like a bit of a melting pot. And a lot of the original founders of Fire Island that were queer wanted to go there for anonymity and quiet and then suddenly became like a party island and the scene was always exploding but also there were a lot of issues with it and I'm sure there still are so a lot of classism a lot of racism a lot of body fascism transphobia so a lot of things going on I was very hesitant because this is also part memoir. I thought it might be too romanticizing of Fire Island, but it's not. It is both celebratory of its unquestionable importance in especially American queer culture, but I think in general, you know, when we think about other sort of queer resorts now, like Fire Island, it's kind of like the blueprint and quite a lot of art that it has gone mainstream has been produced within the realms or, or have been inspired by Fire Island. So we can't deny its importance. And I think that is important to acknowledge and Jack Parlett does. But he also acknowledges all of the negative aspects. So it's a really rich cultural exploration that started as a sort of literary history. So it goes into Patricia Highsmith and Frank O'Hara and a lot of other queer artists that lived here. I actually did a blurb of this for my shop and also I did a review but it's not up yet because we are doing some website reno. It's just one of those books that is just so for me because it blends memoir, it blends cultural history, literary history, queer history and it's super Extremely well written and so engaging. I literally could not put this down. At times I had to and I was like, okay, but like one page, one more page. So the fact that I got that from nonfiction, especially in a year where I've been reading so much fiction, it's great to see that the pics are popping. And then finally, one of definitely the best books that I've read this year, Ace what asexuality reveals about desire society and the meaning of sex by angela chen this i saw in a lot of places for a long time but then i finally picked it up because danny said it was really good and i body read this with natalie from a curious reader so i will link danny's bookstagram and natalie's channel down below so you can check them out this is amazing this is so good i have been raving about this to so many people this is a journalistic and memoiristic exploration of asexuality what it is where does it come from is it a real thing and what it means that asexual people exist basically it goes into the online communities that generated the label and the problems with those communities as well as the benefits and it also goes into the history of asexuality before that and 
how people perceive it now. Again, issues of ableism, especially the ableism and racism issues were so interesting. And the way she synthesizes these ideas is just so good. I wish if I ever go back to academia that this is the way that I write. It's just astonishingly good. It's compulsively readable, but it engages with theory as well as evidence. She did interviews. It's just so good. I honestly think this is up there with your best journalist's book. So if you think of Catch and Kill, if you think of Empire of Pain, it is on that level and maybe even superior because it incorporates theory which often journalist books don't have to do and so Angela Chen did it all did it in a slim book she provides further reading she provides notes she provides references it's it's just so good if you take anything from this please go read this book I think Everyone who is interested in activism needs to pick this up. That's my wrap up. <laughs> Have you read any of these books? Do you want to read them after hearing me talk about them? Any and all comments can go down below. I will be editing videos. I really need to edit my wrap up of Earthlings by Sayaka Murata. It's just, I look so different in that video. It's ridiculous, but I am, I, I'm not going to re-record it. I'm going to edit that video. I will come back probably though with the January wrap up because that video has been haunting me for more than a month already. Please tell me what you've been reading, how you've been doing. Again, comments down below and that's it. See you next time.